Okay, it is uh, six o'clock. This is uh, Todd Schmidt, um, village administrator. I'm just going to go through a couple, a uh, couple basic logistics. Um, one thing for those uh, attending, um, and at this point, I show uh, eight in attendance. That's great. Um, perhaps more will jump on too, but um, give, uh, we'll we'll accept all the grace that you're willing to offer, as we haven't done a listening session before over, uh, over this system. So we're giving this a shot. Um, but uh, all the attendees are um, are muted. Um, but there is an option on the system as at least if you're participating through the through the uh, application system to raise your hand. Um, somewhere on your screen, you'll find that little function. And uh, the way that's going to work when when Chris opens it up for questions is um, as people do raise their hand, it will show me on my screen the order in which those hands are raised. And then one by one, I'll go down through that list and uh, pull up the uh, get, make make the first person on the list uh, able to talk and ask their question. Uh, keep in mind when you do ask a question, make sure you state your name and your address. Uh, so we're aware. Um, and then uh, then once you're done with your question, I'll lower your hand and Chris or other members of the management team who are on the call with us today will work to answer your question. Uh, my promise is that if we can't answer your question uh, here uh, today, we'll attempt to find that answer and get that answer to you uh, as a follow-up email or phone call later on in the week. Um, the other thing, some people are participating by phone. Um, according to my according to my system here, I, I do show one one phone participant. Uh, I don't. I'm not familiar with a raise hand feature for those calling in. So what we will do after we do the hand raised portion for those on the app, um, I will open up the line to speak to those on phone to find out if they have any questions. So we haven't missed their questions as well. I would also say if you do find that your question is answered over the course of the discussion, but the hand is still raised, you can also lower the hand um, on your system as well. So those are, I think those are the, that's the gist of the basics. You do have our whole management team here today. I think Chris intends to introduce us and as a reminder to them, they're muted as well. They do need to speak, remember to unmute. Um, we are recording this session and we'll be posting it to the village's YouTube page um, afterwards, uh, later on in the week, if anybody cares to watch it in the future. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And those attending can now see all the participants. And I will turn it over to Chris. Thanks, Dad. Thanks, Dad. Welcome, everybody, tonight. Um, if one of the panelist members can put your hand up to make sure I'm, everybody can hear me. All right, thanks everybody. Um, welcome to our listening session. Uh, you know we try to hold these about once every quarter and answer questions that people in the community have and, and give updates for various things that you have interest in um, or take any suggestions that you have uh, for what we could be doing better in the community. Um, so I would start by just introducing all of the people that are um, on the Zoom with us tonight. Um, another board member, Phil Willems, is, has joined for this. Um, as you know, we can only have two on here um, for reasons that uh, we just don't want to have a quorum, a uh, walking quorum. So we have Phil and I here tonight. Um, Tim Herlitzka is here for Wanaki Utilities General Manager. Kevin Even, our Village Engineer, Director of Public Works. Sue McDade, our Community Services Director. Why don't you guys wave when I say your name so, in case they're so they know. Um, Caitlin Steen, our Deputy Administrator and Village Clerk. Um, Renee Meinholtz, our Finance Director. Kevin Plendel, our police chief. Cindy Moseman, our senior services director. Eric Plum, our library director. Scott Russell, our EMS director. Kylie West, our executive assistant. Kylie's black blotted out, but she's there as well. And then Todd, of course, up in the top there, our village administrator and economic development uh, director. So the reason that it's unusual for a listening session to have all our department heads here, and I want to thank all of them first off for being here. Uh, we'll probably limit the first hour, um, kind of keeping to a schedule of 6 to 7.30. 
Uh, but the first hour, I wanted to make sure we have people, if they have questions with regards to anything in the village specific to, to the COVID coronavirus situation, um, that we have um, those department heads here that they can answer any questions and also give a little bit of an update on what each of their departments has been doing um, since the very beginning of that. Um, after, after that, I think we'll open it up for any other questions or comments that residents have um, and just lead off with that. Um, I'd like to thank all of our department heads um, for the wonderful job they've been doing through these last couple of weeks. Um, our staff has been stressed um, to the max. They've been stretched. They're doing a wonderful job for everybody in the community and making sure that um, we have all the necessary government uh, functions available to all of our residents as well as keeping them safe um, through this time. And I'm sure each of them will be happy to share um, just a couple minutes, a minute or two, just of what their departments are doing. So I'm gonna kind of go around right now um, just to talk about that quickly. Scott Russell from our EMS, I'll probably give him a little extra time just to give current updates as far as what's going on in, in, in um, our current area, our, our area here, as well as uh, things that he has firsthand knowledge of. So I'm gonna start actually with you, Scott, if you would just give us a little update on um, you know, what's happening at EMS and, and what we're dealing with. Uh, sure, Chris, can you hear me okay? A little wave? Yes. yes. All right, perfect. Um, so I guess we'll start off a little bit, and I apologize, I'm looking at my notes on my computer here, with uh, what's going on in our area. When I speak area, I'm talking both our EMS district, Northern Central Dane County, as well as Dane County as a whole. Um, as of this morning, we did have 346 positive cases. Um, again, I always preach, take that with a grain of salt because those are the patients that have been tested. For every patient that's been tested, there's probably 20 or 25 that have been told to stay home and just kind of shelter in place. So there's definitely a lot more out there. However, um, a lot of the, the news coming out of the County Emergency Operations Center and Dane County Madison Public Health is that the Safer at Home order is working. Uh, right now, we were projected to have approximately 22,000 infections um, which would put us somewhere between 440 and 1,500 deaths. Um, we are nowhere near that. So it's, it's definitely working. It's having the effect that it should. Uh, right now, the biggest concerns are all surrounding what happens when we come out of the safer at home order. Uh, we all have to start looking forward. We can only handle staying at home for so long. Uh, both economic purposes and mental health purposes. Uh, so we do fully expect for this to, to re-spike again as soon as those safer at home orders get lifted. Um, otherwise, from, from more of a district standpoint, um, as I'm sure most of you have seen, there's been a lot of declarations of a, um, emergency, those kinds of things. A lot of that falls into the nature of being able to get funding from the national, national level. When there's FEMA involved, there's a lot of funding to come back on the back end to be able to help us out financially with the money that we've had to spend on this. So that's where a lot of those emergency declarations come in. On more of a department level, uh, we've been hit fairly decently with this. Um, obviously, a lot of our day-to-day -day operations have changed. Um, aside from daily disinfecting of the ambulances and the, the building itself, We've closed the building down to public. Um, our front foyer still remains open, to which we do have a phone that has a direct line to 911 should we get any walk-in patients. Um, if you see us on the streets, we're gonna be in a lot more protective gear than you would normally see us. Uh, we're wearing masks and face shields and goggles on every call, every patient contact that we have. Um, again, with this being community spread, you're just not quite sure who has it. You just have to assume that everybody you come in contact with has it. Uh, we've gone down to a skeleton staffing concept, so you're only going to see two people on the ambulance most of the time. Um, this actually has had kind of a, an interesting effect on us, being that we are, even though we have some volunteers, we are still primarily volunteer driven. Um, a lot of the volunteers aren't working right now. Uh, so with them not working, they have a lot more time to give us and obviously are looking for ways to get out of the house. So with that, we've been able to staff our second ambulance fairly regularly. Uh, right now, we're sitting on about 80% of the time we have both ambulances staffed. Um, unlike most departments in our area, our call volume has actually stayed fairly steady. We do not see as many 
regular calls as I call them. Um, you don't see as many car crashes and those types of things, but we are seeing a, an influx of your respiratory calls, uh, something that we call EIDS positive. It's, it's an emergency screening for epidemics like this. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of those patients. We have transported positive patients. Um, we've transported a lot of patients that got tested and, and came back negative as well. Uh, our biggest concern, obviously, is keeping our membership safe as well as the public safe because there is a reality that we're going to be carrying it on our person without knowing it. Um, with that, we've worked closely with some of the, uh, the nursing homes in the area to try to prevent us from going into the nursing homes and possibly meeting them at the door, those kinds of things. Um, if you do end up having to call 911 during this period, you'll notice the 911 operator is asking you a lot of questions. And then afterwards, they're going to ask you to meet us at the door. Um, we're trying to cut down on how many people we send into residence at any given time. Um, so there's going to be a lot of cases where we meet patients at the door and have them walk out to the ambulance. Again, for our safety and for the patient's safety, so we don't have very much uh, contact. Other than that, it's just been a lot of preparing for the worst and hoping for the best. Um, Lastly, before I, I give it back to Chris, I do want to say thank you to the community and the individuals that have reached out with support. Um, when we started this whole process about a month ago, we didn't have a ton of masks um, and PPE supplies. It's just not something that, that our kinds of departments keep in stock. We keep about two weeks worth of stock at any given point. Um, we're a kind of need it as you buy it type of, type of world these days. So the community has really reached out. We've had a local company 3D printing face shields for us. We've had a lot of individuals and companies supply us with N95 masks, um, other different types of gowns and PPE and whatnot to the point where we were actually really, really well stocked here. And that's, that's a true testament to the community and everything they've given to us. So I did want to say thank you um, before I turned it back over to Chris. So Chris. Thanks, Scott. And I think what we'll do is we're going to go through all the department heads and then Todd, if we have residents that wave their hands and have questions specific to those departments, we'll take those all at the end um, after they've given their little talk. Okay, so I'm going to keep with this in the EMS kind of theme here and go to Kevin Plendel, our police chief. Good evening. Our main concern is to keep our folks healthy here. That's kind of priority one for us. We've uh, changed our, our way of proceeding each day. We've kind of got people that people that are leaving for the day and people that are coming in that we're kind of keeping them separate. Every car is cleaned at the start of the shift and the end of the shift. Officers are given PPE equipment, including masks, gowns, eye protection, gloves. Um, we're fairly well stocked. We've been in contact with Scott through EMS on a regular basis and we've been pretty successful with maintaining our, our, our level of equipment. Um, kind of gone to a different route in a lot of our contacts with the public. A lot of those contacts now, we are stressing that we're either going to deal with them over the phone um, or at a distance. We've met a number of residents at the door of their homes. If we are actually physically going to go there in person, um, that we're not entering residences unless we absolutely need to. Uh, EMS calls, we restricted our response to those. Generally, we were uh, went on almost all the EMS calls in the village. We restricted to certain priority EMS calls or anything that may have a crime component to it. Um, so we're going to far fewer of those types of calls. The overall number of law enforcement calls in Dane County is down significantly. Um, it's also down here. We have seen a spike in domestic related calls and in, in the mental health related calls. Um, that was kind of predicted by uh, other groups within you know, the last month looking at some of the cause and effect of what was going to happen with this pandemic. So. It kind of has come to fruition, particularly in the domestic side of that for us. Um, other than that, we, you know, really kind of taking a low key approach to enforcing uh, the emergency order. And by that, I mean, um, contacting people that we see or we receive a call about that are in violation. Um, people have been good here. We've made a lot of contacts in parks with people violating. Um, encountered only a few times where we've had groups of 10 or more those people have been very cooperative with us um, once we have contact with them. And again, we're in a low key approach to it, just kind of letting them know that uh, they're in violation and requesting that they stop what they're doing and move on. And uh, that's been really good. 
And as far as businesses, we had a couple of complaints early on and those businesses um, were great. They took it to heart. They changed their, their approach to things and that's been very successful. Uh, one other business that we got a complaint on last week that was uh, potentially open and shouldn't have been, uh, they ended up closing at the end of the day. They have not been back open since. So, um, so far so good when it's come to compliance with uh, the order for us. Great, thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Um, next we'll go to, let's go to Cindy Moseman with our seniors. Hello, everyone. The Senior Center um, has been continuing to deliver meals to the folks in our service area. We're delivering about 110 meals, a noon meal, and we're doing that Monday through Friday. We are the only uh, Senior Center in Dane County that is delivering meals daily. All the rest have gone to Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Monday, Thursday. So we're reaching out to our folks on a daily basis. Starting yesterday, we've added a second delivery. It comes in the afternoon, and it's two meals that folks can have Monday night and Tuesday night for their dinners. And then on Wednesday afternoon, they're getting another delivery with a meal for Wednesday night and Thursday evening. On Fridays, along with their lunch, they're going to be receiving a box um, from Dane County that has shelf-stable food in it. So uh, we have a lot of contact with those home-delivered meal folks. The case managers who are working from home are contacting all of their clients. They are starting at the list, starting with folks who are more vulnerable, uh, who don't have family in the area, they're checking with them to see if they are getting their medications. Um, do they have food in their refrigerator? Um, some of the things folks have been worried about are paying their bills. So the case managers are chatting with them every day. The program coordinator, since she's not busy doing any programming right now, she is spending time calling folks who came to the senior center who don't get meals and um, just to make sure that, that they're okay in their homes and they're having what they need. The driver escort program, which gave people rides to doctor's appointments, has been suspended effective tomorrow. So no longer will there be any volunteers taking people to doctor's appointments. Most of the doctor's appointments had been canceled, but we did have a few coming in that uh, physicians told us were necessary. Now those folks are going through the Dane County Ride Program and not through us. Um, our phones are ringing every day. There's two staff in the building every day at the Senior Center and we're answering questions. We're also getting calls from family members who maybe don't live in this area and are worried about their parents. So we're making a lot of contact with people. Uh, there is a, a grocery program set up so people can get groceries delivered through our bus service transit solutions in Dane County. And um, if anyone's interested about that, they certainly can contact me. Um, it's a great program and people can get, there's no waiting list. People are getting their groceries delivered the same day. If anybody has any concerns about any older adults in their neighborhood or their area, um, I encourage them to, to contact the Senior Center. Thanks. Thank you, Cindy. We'll move over to your co-building supporter, Sue McDade. Good evening, everybody. So um, Village Center um, is close to the public and all of our programming that was scheduled for late March, April, now the first couple weeks of May um, has been canceled. Um, so not being able to play and see all of our customers coming and going out of the Village Center um, has been a big change for us. A um, couple of us are here in the office on a daily basis. The rest of my team is working remotely, so we are all also available um, to chat with our customers, answer questions about um, programming that might be coming up later in the year, shelter rentals, village center rentals, all of those kinds of things that need to be sorted out. Um, we're also taking advantage of not seeing our customers on a daily basis um, 
and spending some time or building staff, um, limited numbers, have been cleaning, waxing floors, doing some maintenance projects, really spending some time taking some really good care of our facilities. So that's probably the silver lining in um, being here alone. Um, a couple of the other things that have been continuing, we've got some park planning projects that are able to continue um, with remote meetings and some of our consultants. So we're definitely keeping busy and looking forward to the day when Scott tells us that we can play again. Perfect. Thank you, Sue. And then let's look, let's go to our other facility that's brand new. We love it. It's a, a wonderful thing to look at and we can't use right now um, to a full extent. So Eric Plum, our library director. Thanks, Chris, and good evening. Yeah, it's very um, sad to be in the new library these days. Um, we have a skeleton staff that goes in every day just to make sure that the bills are paid and that the place is cleaned. Um, and it's just not, it's magical self without the people that we see every day. So uh, we are closed by uh, state order. The Safer at Home order did close public libraries uh, as a specific category through April 24th. Uh, so we are waiting for that order to either expire or uh, to be lifted at, at some point in the near future. Uh, we are talking with our, uh, with libraries in Dane County about what limited services would look like uh, after the Safer at Home order expires. So whether it would be curbside pickup, whether it'd be limited access to the building itself, uh, those are all options on the table. But until we have the delivery system that transports items between the libraries and the South Central Library System, we can't really open. Uh, so we'll be looking at hopefully something uh, to provide to people in May. Okay, thanks, Eric. Then we'll go from Eric over to Kevin Even. Good evening. Uh, just a little quick update on a couple of our departments. Public Works is gone to a split shift. Uh, they're actually now because we started the mowing, they're, both shifts are working, but they're on a staggered start time. So they're never in the building at the same time. I think many of you have heard that we put the spring cleanup on hold till the fall. So it'll be follow the, if things proceed as, as they're predicting, the, uh, We'll, I guess we'll, we'll reevaluate back in the fall to see if it makes sense. The lawn mowing started start this week, even though they're, it's probably snowing out today. Uh, building inspection continues to do what they can. They're taking building permits. We've got some activity going on. Um, they are not entering into houses unless, they, unless they've not been occupied yet. So we're relying on homeowners or, or builders to send us photos or videos. And then we use that to document the the inspections. The planning is continuing. We had our planning commission meeting last night. That went fairly well. Uh, the Heritage Hills will be on our agenda for Monday night. They're anxious to get going. They indicated that they have uh, some interest in the type of homes that they're proposing and do want to start to is sometime uh, the middle of summer. Other construction going on, the Woodland Crests have indicated they're, they're starting back up again. And then there's a couple other private projects that are gonna start, Arboretum uh, Village, the roadway of Cop Road, which is a requirement by the developers, part of the, of the project on that side of town. And then uh, our board awarded the, the 2020 road project. So our contractor will be starting sometime this summer, but that's asphalt related and the asphalt plants typically don't open till sometime like the middle of May. Back to you, Chris. Okay, thanks, Kevin. And with that, I'll go over to Tim Herlitzka um, with our utilities. Thank you, good evening, everyone. Um, just a couple updates from the utilities. Um, our lobby has been closed for a number of weeks to the, uh, to the public, um, but we are still trying to provide a, a still a strong level of service to our customers through phone or email. Um, I will say that our customers have been really good during this process. Um, and uh, everybody's been very understanding of the situation that we're in. 
Um, we continue to have two uh, electric department staff plus one water sewer department staff member on standby uh, to try to protect for the worst case scenario. Uh, if we had a, uh, a number of our employees uh, be ill, uh, fortunately we have not thus far. Uh, we do have mutual aid agreements in place with uh, surrounding uh, municipalities if uh, the worst case scenario ever uh, did happen, which we're fortunate that it hasn't. And um, I just will uh, end by saying that our staff has been really great during this process. And um, uh, we're fortunate to have a really good group of people uh, working for the community. And that's it. Thanks, Tim. And let's go to Renee in our finance. Thanks, Chris. Hi, everybody. Um, so our finance department, um, we're still doing all the critical finance functions, payroll, accounts payable, cash receiving, um, treasury management. Uh, we're delivering that um, both from, um, from the office in part and also remotely. Um, so we, it's myself and my two staff people. Um, there's some critical things that have to take place in the office and then they are um, coming into the office. I'm generally uh, there every day. Um, also to make sure that um, the work keeps flowing um, and uh, we're all available either by email or um, if they're not in the office they will return calls throughout the day um, throughout the workday there um, everybody is always available um, for any questions or um, you know from from residents or other staff um, if that's needed thanks Renee and last but not least, I think, is Caitlin Steen. Uh, Caitlin, um, I'm just gonna start with, or I, I'm ending with you for a reason. We just finished our election um, results last night. Um, I would say congratulations to Aaron Moran, uh, Bill Ranham, Nyla Fry. Um, they'll be uh, our new, they're re two are reelected. We have a new board member as well, and I'm sure you'll be involved heavily with uh, getting onboarding that new, new uh, board member here with us. Uh, but kind of take us through the election and, and how we were able to keep our people safe and the, the fabulous job that you and your team did. Yeah, thank you, Chris, and good evening, everyone. Um, so the clerk's department obviously just wrapped up um, the election, which occurred last Tuesday, but officially wrapped up yesterday at about four o'clock. Um, number of different safety measures we put in place at the polls, um, including uh, thanks to our public works department. Um, if you showed up and voted in person, you saw that we had sneeze guards put in place. Um, election workers were provided safety equipment such as masks and gloves to wear. Voters were encouraged to bring their own pen um, and asked to sanitize their hands as they walked in and left the polling place. Um, so they brought their own, they also were, I think I said, they already asked to bring their own pens so that we weren't sharing pens. Um, if people didn't bring their own pen, they were provided a pen from the village. Um, we created um, distinct pathways for voters to come in and exit the polling place um, so that way they didn't cross paths with each other. Um, so a number of things. Um, we sanitized all hard services in the polling places every 10 minutes. We had two dedicated people, one in each polling place, that um, their sole job all day was just to wipe everything down. Um, so. Um, for the 13% of our voters who chose to come in person, I think uh, we tried to keep the environment and our workers as safe as possible. Um, so we had a total of 5,312 votes cast in this past election. Of those, 87% were absentee ballots that were walked through the process between the 7th and yesterday. Um, so yeah, I think overall uh, we can say from our end that the, the uh, with everything that went on with this election, with the governor's orders and the Supreme Court, both Wisconsin and the US Supreme Court, um, all the changing information that came out, which seemed to change by the minute up until uh, the end of election day, um, we were able to um, go forward with our election and I think run a pretty smooth process. So now that the election is um, wrapping up, um, I know there's, we've gotten some calls in the clerk's office already, um, people going on my vote saying, why isn't my participation showing up? Um, people need to know that this is a manual process closing out the election. Uh, we now take those paper poll books and we, in, we manually put them into the WISC vote system, which talks to my vote. 
um, which then will record your vote and participation in the election and share that with my vote. So that takes could take up to 30 days. Um, we get 30 days past the election to go through that process. Um, I anticipate us to go through that a lot quicker, but um, just so everyone knows in the public, if you're out on my vote and it's not showing you voted or it's not showing that your ballot was cast, uh, please give us some patience while we work through actually re reconciling and closing out this election. Um, as we move forward in the clerk's office, uh, we look forward to things like liquor licensing. Our annual liquor licensing process will begin soon. Um, board of review and the annual property assessment process will begin soon. So I'm um, kind of shifting off of election and moving on to our other annual tasks. And then of course, uh, we have two more elections that occur later this year. We have an August and the November election. So um, moving forward, like we always do in the clerk's office, um, other than clerk duties, I've just been assisting Todd and doing a bunch of internal policies um, to respond to the COVID-19 and our, our closure of facilities and what that means for our staff. So I've been doing a lot of internal HR work with Todd as well. Caitlin, thanks. I'm going to bring back, I'll t I'm going to have some comments later in regards to all of you, but um, I just want to say thank you all for being here tonight for the residents and Chris, Chris, you kind of broke up there towards the end of that last statement. Just if you have if you have any comments you would like to make, and, and do we have any questions currently in the queue? Um, we don't have questions, but I'm ready to uh, coordinate that process if you'd like. Yeah, um, so if, if we have any questions for any of our staff from people in attendance tonight, this is the time for us to ask those. I'd like to give them the opportunity to get back to theirs and their families and, um, you know, they're putting in long hours right now. So Chris, you're, um, you're freezing up a little bit here, Chris. Hey, Chris, one, one option may be to turn off your video feed. Um, it's possible you might have a bandwidth issue on your end. Mine right now? I can hear you now, but you're cutting out. So is it better now? It is. We'll, we'll, keep an, we'll keep an eye on it. Okay, thanks. So I do, oh, there was a hand up and the hand went down. Um, but I believe this is the opportunity. Okay, there we have uh, one hand up. Um, it's our... It's our new uh, incoming board member, Nyla Fry. So um, I will give her the ability to talk. All right, Nyla, um, you're welcome to ask your question. Um, you, if you can unmute yourself first. Okay, can there you, you hear go. Me? Yes, okay. we can. Uh, this pertains to the development on Division Street of the road. And uh, so I knew I needed to ask Kevin. Uh, what are the plans for Division Street going through? And I would really like to um, know how um, it's being designed so that we know we will be able to maintain tobogganing and sledding on Water Tower Hill. Did you hear it? I got it, Nyla. Nyla, good question. I would say that as part of this phase one development, we will not need to make that decision now. So the intention was, before we get to the next phase, that we would start the planning process and Viridian has agreed to have some feedback going on. Okay, thank you. But I think Nyla just needs just to a little bit. Yeah, maybe if you could mute Nyla. Well, thanks, I think that's better. Now, I think over the, now that we're going to have public works the committee as well as the parks committee over the next year is going to have to make plans for that particular development to make sure, because I think it was important to the board, that the road go through, but also to maintain the sledding hill. I would echo that, those comments from Kevin, that the board um, was pretty clear, I think, that we want that hill to remain. Um, and get the road through at the same time. So that engineering is gonna be taking place over the next 12 months and I'm sure it's gonna be a topic that we address moving forward. Yeah. 
Uh, Nyla, I've got you unmuted. Do you have any follow-up questions? No, I'm trying to figure out what I'm supposed to do here, though. Uh, you, yeah, I'm, I'll, I'm, I'll uh, send you back to the attendee portion, and I'll lower the hand. There. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yep, thanks for the question. Okay. Uh, others with questions, please raise raise your hand on the system. So we'll give it like another 30 seconds here. If we don't have any residents that want to ask any questions, um, I'd like to let our, our uh, staff go as soon as possible here. So um, please, please, if you have a question for any, any of the different departments, do this, do so now. Okay, we have a question. Uh, I have the name John, but John, if you could, uh, I'll bring you in to talk. If you could just introduce yourself and your address, please. And there you are, we have John. Give my, take my call. Long time listener, first time caller, I know. Um, <laughs> my name is John Frona, I'm at 1711 Dunwoody and a uh, new resident of Wanaki actually as of the end of December. So appreciate all the updates here and the uh, work that you guys are doing, especially to keep the community safe during this time. I guess there's two questions. One is uh, I'm, I haven't really been aware of what all the plans are for the sort of where the, I guess it's gonna be a high V or something along um, Century Avenue there. And so I was just kind of curious as to what what the big bigger plans are for that whole area of development. And then the second question kind of relates to when we we're talking about the um, meals for the elderly. I was wondering if there's need, I know like there's the food bank that seems to have needs for more donations or are there other things that people in the community can do to help support our community members during this time? John, thanks for the questions. Um, as far as the high V development, um, Kevin kind of addressed that a little bit. They're going to be—they're just starting up again with um, the groundwork. I believe most of the infrastructure has been completed. Um, they'll be putting in the uh, asphalt roads. Um, so forth coming up here, probably far behind it. Kevin, you can maybe address that. Um, as well as there's another developer, developer that is right next to Hy-Vee across the road, um, who's looking at putting up a building that's come through um, already as well. Um, Quick Trip um, has started, I believe, though at least some of the earthwork down next to Boston's uh, Pizza, and we just took another um, presentation for another Quick Trip that's right across from uh, the Hy-Vee, basically across Highway Q. That's what I would know about the high V development at this point. Kevin, do you have anything else that I missed? Chris, I would just add that construction is starting. Their goal was to have the infrastructure in uh, sometime in June. If things go well, I think by the middle of June, we'll have the majority of the infrastructure in, and high V would be in a position to be able to start their, their store. And is there is there a place where this information exists, like in terms of plans that have been approved, is that, that I can just review if I was interested? Yes, if you send me an email at kevin at wanakee.com, I can send you a link to the plans that were approved at the Planning Commission. Okay, thanks, thanks Kevin. Um, and then Cindy, uh, maybe I can have you address the meals that he's asking about and donations and how, where people can go for those things. Well, right now the the Home delivered meal program is through Dane County, who holds a contract with the local high school and Taher the Cater. We're very lucky that um, we have that relationship. And so they're providing our meals to us. We still have most, if not all of our daily volunteers delivering who are all seniors. And then I do have a list of folks who have reached out uh, to help deliver those afternoon meals. And we're also using a lot of senior, um, senior center staff on Monday afternoons and then village employees um, have all stepped up in many ways. And we have a schedule where many of them will be helping us deliver on Wednesday afternoons and Fridays. But I do have a list of folks if they're interested in helping out and we need that. Um, I have 
their names and addresses and emails and phone numbers. And um, if we need them, we will, we will call them. But right now we seem to be um, pretty well set with the, the folks that we have scheduled. Okay, John, any other questions or was that, was that uh, adequate for you? That's, that's great, thank you, I'm all set. Okay, and thanks and welcome to Wanakee. Um, Todd, any others? I just say, I see Phil, Phil was trying to get your attention there, Chris. I think he wanted to add something. Yes, uh, at our meeting this week with Rotary, we had our Zoom meeting. We donated uh, some funds to the program at the school for the Meals for Kids. If John was interested, I'm sure that uh, Randy Gutenberg would be interested in accepting a donation to help out on that thing. Do you get that? Yep. Yep, thanks, Phil. All right, John, I will, um, I'll send you back over to the attendee side of the, of the system here. Thanks for the question. Um, I don't see any other hands up at the moment, but um, people don't have to wait for the next opportunity to ask a question. If you have a question anytime during our discussion here, just uh, click the raise hand and I can come over and I'll see the order in which they were raised. So no hands raised at with, the moment. With that, Todd, then I'm just gonna have I have an, uh, another hand, Chris. Okay, go ahead. Nyla has another question. Here you go, Nyla. Uh, I didn't know when I should ask this question, but it's primarily merely from Chris, for Chris. Um, Chris, hey, Nyla. Nyla, if it's for me, then let's let's plan for once our staff is off. Okay, we can, sounds we can, good. We can let them get going as soon as possible. Okay, sounds good. Okay, I do have. Another one uh, from Linda Ashmore. I'll switch you over now, Linda. No, just a moment. Getting used to this. Oh, Linda, your hand went down. Are you still, I'll bring you in. Whoops. <laughs> okay, Linda, did you have a question? Yeah, um, I've been seeing people asking about the sidewalk repairs, and that is kind of a bad time since the economy's tanking. Um, if there's any consideration of maybe giving them more time to make those payments. Chris, you're muted. There you go. Linda, thanks for the question. Uh, yeah, that's one of the discussions that we've had. Um, I spoke with Kevin mm, earlier this week in regards to this. And uh, we have a program in place for people in general um, that if, it, if it's a situation where it's difficult for them to pay for uh, their portion of the repairs, we can spread that out and, and work with the, with the person to make sure that um, it's, it's acceptable to them. Um, obviously, we, we understand that there's times going on and we're going through our normal process that we don't get behind um, with the repairs that we're making and making sure that people are safe within those sidewalks. And that's really the main reason we wanna to continue to have that program, making sure that they're corrected and uh, we don't have any potential injuries or accidents for people. Kevin, do you wanna add anything to that? Let me just me add, one? yeah, just let me just add that uh, Renee and I talked about it and it's certainly part of our budget. We expect that the portion that the residents are paying this year in this year's budget is around $15,000. There weren't any uh, single homeowners that were over 500. And we normally have, uh, or we have a policy in place that I think it's over 500 or $750. They, they, they get the option of paying over time. And what you and I discussed, if, if it's appropriate, and I certainly think the board could take action on it, is, is to allow them to extend, even if it's under the $500, to extend that over a number of years, uh, three to five years, even for the lower amount. And if that's, if that's something the board is interested in pursuing, we can, we can send out a, an updated letter to the residents that received it. And Renee reminded me that, you know, these payments don't even go out generally till the sometime in, in late August. So it's not something we need to, to rush to do. 
So if it's something that we want to pursue over the next uh, couple of board meetings, we can add it on to add as an agenda item and give, uh, you know, homeowners the opportunity to pay over time, even for the lower amounts. Thanks, Kevin. Um, Linda, did that um, answer your question? And do you have any others? Um, yes, it did. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Linda. Uh, any other hands for questions? There are none at the moment, Chris. Okay, then what I'm going to say is, is I would give a standing ovation to our staff if I could right now. I mean, I guess I could stand, but it's not going to have the big impact that I would want it to um, with regards to everything that we've had to deal with and the, the wonderful performance that you've had to provide uh, and, and go through for all of our community. Uh, this is a difficult time. I can say without a doubt that our staff are true professionals making sure that we have everything covered. Um, as you heard, as we went around the, the table, so to speak, with all the department heads, we have things covered and we've had things covered from the very beginning um, to make sure that all of our residents have what they need. That goes down to our, our elections um, with all the changes that were going on. Caitlin was describing the day of and the, how, how wonderful, a beautiful job so many compliments have been given to, to the staff, um, to me, with regards to that, making sure we were keeping people stay, safe and getting them through in a timely fashion. Um, our turnout was still a strong turnout, um, probably similar to the last election, I would say, Caitlin, yes, um, with that. And before that was even more difficult than the day of, in my opinion, for our staff and what they had to do. I know Sue is up at the top of my screen right now, Sue McDade. Sue is over helping stuff envelopes, put um, labels on, do all the things. We had Bill, Bill from our public works came over. We took as a true team effort to make sure that we were getting everybody what they needed for the election. So my hat's off to all of you and each of your departments uh, and what you do and, and thank you for all that you're doing. And with that, I want to say, go home and get some rest and get ready for tomorrow. You guys can all pop off the screen if you if you so choose or stay if you'd like to. So thank you guys. Okay. So Todd, let's uh, go to um, other things that people may have questions in regards to. Um, I know Nyla had a question for sure, so we can probably just go right back to her. Okay, I'll bring her in. Okay. We'll get used to. Oh, I'm muted now. Please. Nope, you're good, Nyla. Am I good? Okay. Uh, please bear with me while I try to uh, give you an information uh, before I get to my question. Um, as Chris and Todd know, uh, it was a year longer um, from the time that uh, a, a grandmother, not me, but another grandmother from Wanakee had started contacting Sue McDade and going through different channels to get soap in her public restrooms in the park, and thank you, that has been accomplished, and I think that was um, a good thing to get accomplished. But my question pertains to, um, and perhaps I'm incorrect, and you can correct me, uh, and I know you will if I'm incorrect, but because of how that decision was made, and the fact that this grandmother had contacted a, a board member, and then it was done in a, a very, short amount of time after that, it appears that she happened to get a hold of the right board member who heard the need and wanted to get the job done. So my question is, um, is information that goes on at listening sessions and at various committees um, shared in a packet or in, um, perhaps um, in an agenda packet where um, it can be seen what has gone on in other committees at a listening session um, because um, when I look at information now, I'm going through, going to each committee, I'm probably doing it the long way and Todd could correct me. I'm going to, to perhaps the public work committee looking at the minutes, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm wondering if the board members ever receive all that information uh, in one packet somehow. To, to help the uh, flow of communication. I 
Chris, you're muted. Thanks, Todd. We're still all getting used to this. Um, yes, the, the the meetings for or the minutes for all the public for all the different committees that we have are shared um, publicly with everyone. Um, I I'm not aware, Todd, of a full packet that goes out to the board members with each minute, um, other than when they come to the board. If we have something that's come um, to the board from those committees, um, is that pretty accurate? I mean, yeah, I, I think I think that's accurate. Um, certainly, nothing is. Uh, board members interested in additional information have it provided to them. Um, but I, I think the practice has been that uh, the board members in that particular committee receive their particular packet without that entire packet going to the full board. Um, although the, the, I believe, I think all of our committees now and committee packets are in the on base system. I could, I might be wrong on all of them, but um, they are available electronically too. I'm, you know, maybe Phil can chime in about how he is or isn't able to uh, access materials. And I'm, and I would, I would just add, uh, I'm not familiar, uh, Nyla, with the circumstance with a grandmother who you said um, spoke to a particular member of the board. Um, I just know that um, from from last fall. Uh, that public works have been working to a uh, particular bill has been looking into and researching options for the soap ever since the bathrooms were closed last fall. But Phil, did you have anything to add, sir, about your... I, I do. Um, I myself, if I'm interested in something from a meeting, will I talk to the chair or at worst, if I can't reach the chair, one of the members and ask them about it. But failing that, no, I don't try to keep track of every item on their agenda. And the committees that I chair, I try to pass the uh, nuts and bolts of it onto the general meeting when we have it, for example, other than the fact that, you know, we vote on some streets well, yes, we voted on the streets. I don't think it's necessary to read them all because they are noticed as public record and the timing. But uh, if we have something that's really uh, earth shaking and a change, you know, we try to bring it all to the to the whole board. And I think that Phil, you're speaking in terms of your your approach to it. I know other board members may work uh, differently in terms of how they go about accessing information. Chris, did you have more to add? No, nope, that's that's pretty much an, an accurate depiction. Nyla, you're still live if you wanted to follow up. Uh, yeah, I guess um, it, it's very time consuming. And it's not that I, I would like to be able to know everything that's going on, but I think the whole issue with the soap in the parks could have been resolved a lot sooner if the information was out there because you can see in a glance if something you're interested in or something you're missing. Uh, you don't know the topics that are out there until sometimes they're brought forth. So that's just my comment. Okay, thanks, Nyla. I think one thing at least I can do in addition with, with these sessions, and I have in the past, is encourage the full village board to review the recording so they're familiar with the issues at hand. Um, but I'll continue to do that. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Nyla. All right. Then uh, Robert McPherson is the next up with a question, um, and I'll bring him in now. Okay, Robert, you're on. All right. I'll be very quick. Uh, what's the status on Long Boom? I, I I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry. What's What's the status on Long Boom? Oh, wanna boom, Chris, wanna boom. Uh, yeah, so we're, we're obviously going through the whole, um, we're following everything that's going on with regards to COVID here. And um, I would say that we'll be making a decision in regards to wanna boom sometime around June 1st, um, based on vendors and what their responses have been as far as when we need to contact them and let them know for sure. Um, we haven't really gone down the path of 
are we going to reschedule it? Um, are we just going to cancel it? Are we going to um, uh, just tuck our, our funding that we've raised away and, and put it towards next year? We haven't gone down that road. We'll probably have a meeting in May to discuss that. But Chris, you're thinking June 1 is the is your expected date, decision date for the public to know one way or another? Correct. Okay. Robert, Robert did you have a follow up? No, thanks. Okay, thanks, Robert. Um, I have another hand up here. Okay. Uh, Michael Brandt, and I'm going to bring him in. Hi. Okay. Um, th thanks, Todd and Chris and Phil for being on. I, I, I really just want to say thank you so much for making this available. Um, um, this hasn't always been done. I very, very much appreciate accessibility, and it's wonderful you guys are all here to do this. Um, I have not much other than that. I don't want, don't want to waste your time. I have just one quick question. And it may be something you haven't thought of at all yet. So um, I actually wouldn't blame you if you didn't really have any response to it. Um, but reading recently about how a couple of communities, Whitefish Bay and I believe Bayside and maybe also Shorewood, um, took the proactive step of just sending out ballots to all registered voters for absentees for um, this last election. And they saw a very, very high turnout and effectively had almost no one show up at the polls. So I wondered if that's something that the village would be interested in doing. Um, getting people the opportunity to get out there and be safe is just something that's important to me. Um, and wondered if anyone had any thoughts on doing that. That's all. Thank you again. Thanks for the comments, Mike. Um, I would say that with the next election, we're going to be discussing that with Caitlin, making sure we're abiding by everything that we need to do. and and safety of our residents and constituents is of utmost importance. So if it can be done that way, um, safely, securely, and uh, properly, um, it's a decision that the board would, would take up and I would have no problems in, in working with that to get it done. Phil, you might wanna comment as well. It, it's very tough to react to everything. I think we did a pretty good job without a playbook, having to uh, react on the fly and satisfy the changing directions that we were getting out of county and state while it was going on. Um, I'll, I'll add, Mike, that um, I was on a, uh, a uh, conference call with the League of Wisconsin Municipalities today, about 100 and, 130 cities around this call talking about issues of mutual interest and elections came up. There is definitely uh, a, a view on elections that's really front and center as a result of this one on how to best approach this. One of the challenges that clerks face is they're unable to run absentee ballots uh, prior to election day. Uh, we can collect them all uh, really well and we, we collected a lot this time but um, especially if you imagine the particularly lot, the much larger cities, the challenge of holding all those ballots till election day to run them is really tricky. So there is some lobbying interest on a party of municipalities across the state to seek some tweaks to legislation um, that might allow us to better facilitate an election process when we are seeing a much higher number of absentees. So I think what, I, what I'm saying is that there's a lot of agreement uh, on some alternatives to the election process like you suggested. And there's some hope that we'll see uh, law changes that will help accommodate it. And you're still live, Mike, if you had a follow-up. Well, that's good. I, I, I almost started laughing because I realized I was nodding along kind of like an idiot because I realized I'm, my camera's not actually on, but it does have audio. So I, I appreciate those. Um, Answers. That's really good to know. Um, I have maybe one other question if there's no one else raising their hand at the moment. Not at the moment. Go ahead. Um, so the may or may not know about it. The school board um, approved um, creating an ad hoc committee to look at just general issues within um, the whole district, not just one key with any um, 
issues of equity and inclusion. And we kind of use that coded language to um, cover a whole lot of things. Um, the purview of it is more or less just kind of look at issues within the district, discover if there's issues we don't know about, and um, review our best practices to see if we're doing the best job that we possibly can do. Um, I guess my only question on this is that I've gotten kind of a odd amount of blowback, I'll put that, from, from even proposing we have a committee like this. And to explain why I even wanted the committee in the first place, I'm very sensitive to other school districts and the issues they're dealing with. And I particularly was looking at how Baraboo and their school district got sued for not addressing some of these concerns. So it was more of a proactive approach to try to get the district out in front of things. Um, that's why I proposed it in the first place. And that's one of the big reasons why we're doing it. So um, I was surprised that there has been a little bit of pushback saying, why do we need to look at some of these issues? Um, and think it's important. And I guess my overall question is, um, are there specific things that you believe um, the school district can look at to improve upon in terms of issues of including everyone and having equitable access for everyone in our district? Um, I, uh, I certainly don't mean to imply that there's anything wrong with the district at all. I think it's a great district. I'm so happy to live here. Um, so happy to have the wonderful communities that make up the district and it's not an implication that there's anything wrong um, It's a more of a proactive approach to avoid uh, Some of the concerns other districts have had so I guess again question being What do you think are some things that we should look at? Um, if, if if you've observed anything like that in the community I think that's a really good question. I think it's a it's a deep question um, that we probably I'd, I'd probably want some additional time to think about it rather than give you a snap answer on that, Mike. Um, one I've it's totally fair. It's kind of a long winded question. <laughs> yeah, one, one I've always tried um, the best I can to stay out of the school district's um, decisions. Um, I feel that it's important in, in in my role that I don't try to influence. Um, our, our, our community and, and, and as far as the school district goes. Um, I know you guys do wonderful work and, 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 and continue to do that for all of the people um, that you represent, not just one key. So um, before I would make any kind of comments in regards to that, I think I'd want to take a little time to absorb what you said and, and uh, I'd be happy to respond to you in the future. Cool. Um, Chris, would, uh, would it help also possibly, Mike, I, I suppose there's some memos or criteria under which your committee was created. Uh, can you send, send those to Chris for his, for his review as he thinks about your question? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, there's always the possibility too. I mean, I, I, I got to read um, John Lovemeyer's book and he talked about how there at some point used to be kind of like a committee that was made up of municipalities and or like the village and the district together. And that's this is one of those things that I would have kind of loved to talk about with village leaders and you know uh, town leaders beforehand because it's one of those things where this has so much crossover with everybody. I kind of want input on it too as much as I can. So no, I, I will definitely send that over. And I mean, if anyone, if if the village can even kick it out to lists that they have for people who could potentially serve on it, we literally just approved the application last night for people who are interested in serving on it. So. Um, if anyone is interested in serving on it, it'll be open to the community. The idea behind it was just to get more people than just, you know, seven people sitting around a table talking about issues that they might not have any understanding on. So, yeah, I will send it over and I would be happy to talk about it at anybody's uh, availability. Okay, and happy to utilize uh, village resources to help promote, uh, promote the interest if if you could maybe have randy or i can follow up with randy i'll plan to do that tomorrow I'll i think we're i think randy and i are uh, talking on friday to like go over just how we're gonna send it out and getting it to the you know the village and the town and to middleton and everyone okay is, uh, what we're gonna go with next great thank you guys all right thank you. thanks thanks mike um all right we do i do have another hand up nyla's coming coming back for more all right i'll get you get you to you in a second here nyla um, all right, you're, 
You're on now, Nyla. Okay. I have a question pertaining to the survey that's going out pertaining to the strategic planning. Um, I, I've kind of lost with everything that's going on, the details on that, how that's being sent out, who can uh, be part of that survey. And if uh, we get to open things up again and people can meet again, if uh, there's any possibility that we could have a, a open public meeting where people can come and give their views. Chris, did you want me to jump in with a quick update yeah, on that? I'll jump in on that. I mean, I go ahead. Yeah, on the on the survey. So we were we were about ready to click the button for it to get sent out, um, uh, right as right as the uh, COVID pandemic broke out. And um, the goal of the survey in, in how it's being done, it's, it's sent to a random sample of 1,700, uh, 1700 households re or residents, postal, postal customers, I guess. Um, and the purpose is to get a, a, a strong response rate that can allow us to be confident that the answers that we receive are representative of the village as a whole. One thing I was actually just earlier today talking with Chris about this, that uh, amidst the pandemic does, uh, while we may get even better response rate because people are home, maybe paying more attention to their mail, <laughs> quite honestly, um, does this current point in time, will that give us responses that will reflect what is perhaps, um, you know, in an average snapshot of the village's uh, status or the citizen satisfaction within our village. Um, so Chris and I kind of were debating with one another about whether today is the smartest time to try to achieve that snapshot. And at this point, we're feeling like it may not be, and we, perhaps we should wait for a little while, a few months after perhaps the main ask, main impact of the of the pandemic is past us. But I plan to discuss that with the board on Monday night next week um, to fill them in and basically say this very same thing to find out if they agree. Um, the, the survey company that we're using says they're prepared to send it out the moment we say send it. Um, but uh, uh, we're questioning whether it's wise at the moment. So okay, that's, a, that's something we're kind of debating at the moment. Do you have a quest, follow up question? You said, Postal is that five three five nine seven zip codes. They uh, work the zip codes to define the village, the exact village boundaries. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, you had a you had a question. Maybe Chris could address about a community meeting town hall style as well. Yeah, I'm. I'm ne make sure I'm on here. Yep. Uh, I'm never opposed to any of these meetings. I'm. I'm always available. Um, I don't think the board members would be. Um, we just have to call it as a meeting, official meeting, and 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 take in uh, information from the public. I don't think there's anything that would prevent us from doing that. So be happy to take care of that and do that. All right, Nyla, I uh, looks like I have you muted at the moment, and I'm having trouble unmuting you. All right, well. Sorry, now I'm going to send you back over to the attendee portion and there's a couple more hands up. If you want to raise your hand again, you may do so. All right. Um, I have Robert McPherson next. I'll bring him in. Okay, you're in, Robert. All right, hopefully my audio is a little better this time. Um, yep. Is it better? Okay, good. Yep. Uh, so I, I kind of want to swing back to what Mike was talking about because uh, I think he was trying really hard to be nice because he's in a different position uh, politically than I am. So we, I personally experienced probably the strongest uh, unwelcomeness I've ever felt in the village in the past few months uh, with some anti-Semitic comments that were made about me. Uh, I'm not gonna repeat them here, it's not appropriate. Uh, I kind of am curious though, uh, you know, the school board is taking this up to the ad hoc committee what what steps you know is the village taking to be more inclusive because i think if there's one thing that i've heard uh working with housing task force working with pe uh, people during the election and talking with people there seems to be a significant number of minority residents whether it be 
uh, racial or ethnic or religious that repeatedly feel like they're they're marginalized in the community, uh, that they are blocked out of certain aspects of the community simply because they are who they are. You know, it, it's a concern and, um, I, you know, I, I hear a lot about how we're this great community that's, you know, that we, we don't have these problems, but, but we do, we really do. And uh, honestly, until I experienced it firsthand myself, I probably didn't take it even as seriously as I should have. And that, that kind of ends now. So what can the board do to assure those of us in the community that are not white and Christian that, you know, we're just as included in this community as everybody else? Okay, sorry, I was unmuting, trying to unmute, make sure I was able to speak here. First off, I'm sorry if, if that uh, you were a victim of that, Robert. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think our community is a very welcoming and open committee community. I, I've seen that for, for the last 50 years. Um, I have many friends um, from different race minority um, that I, I see them as just another person. Our community is our community. And of course, you're going to have people that may choose not to be as open and, and inclusive as we would all like them to be. Um, steps that we're taking, um, obviously, when we started with our housing committee, um, that you shared, uh, you, you were on that with me, um, we started talking about this and how we can become a more inclusive community as you're describing it. Um, whether it's through a, a housing, whether it's through services, um, just people wanting to come here. Um, I think that it's important for all of us to look at all different aspects of life, whether it's affordability to access to um, whatever it might be. So to say that we can just turn that, I have not been witness to it, you have. Um, it's important for not only our adults, but our, our, our seniors and um, our youth uh, that they can, everybody, we want everybody to feel welcome in Wanaki and have an opportunity in Wanaki. And, you know, that's, I think that's something that we strive for at the board level all the time. Uh, nobody, we don't want anybody to feel that Wanaki is a place that people don't want to come. And th what's, what I've seen is that it's a very much high demand area where people do want to come to. That's where you're seeing our growth and our development that's been taking place. Now, it's, it's something that you, we could debate and, and get into. I feel bad that that happened to you um, in, in, in this process that you've gone through. But um, you know, I think that working together, which it's just something that just needs to be, can, can, you have to work hard at this, not just at one, any one moment, but all the time um, to make this happen. Phil, I don't know if you have any comments. Well, if I could jump in, Chris, I would just raise my hand and say there's, there's no place for, for bigotry, hated race, hatred, racism um, that, that you described, Robert. And I haven't seen the letter you're referencing, but um, if, that's, if that's coming from a village resident, then um, shame on that resident. Uh, there, there's no place for that. And, and I would also add that to the, to the extent that the school is pursuing this, uh, this committee, um, if there, if, and, and I'll, I'll look to hear from Randy, it sounds like Mike and Randy are going to be talking this week, but I'll be interested in talking about ways in which the village can constructively be a, a participating agency, a participating group in that discussion in one way, shape or form. Um, because I, I like, like you and, and I would say others here and as Chris stated, find that to be important. Um, so. My Phil, time. Phil, any comments? Uh, yes. Uh, when I first came to Wanakee, I didn't think I was too accepted. Uh, they didn't seem to like us Southern boys coming up here and trying to run the businesses in town a little bit. And uh, I went to a couple of people and I said, I'm not making friends here. And they said, well, what are you doing about it? I said, well, I'm, I'm here. And they, they led me to some service clubs, and I joined the service clubs and made friends. They led me to uh, playing softball and stuff like that. I think it's, it's a two-way street, and I find the best way to make friends is open up yourself and uh, come to people. Now, for example, uh, I'm here. I'm uh, kind of a busybody around town. If anybody wants to make friends, wants to join a ser some service clubs, I'd be happy to sponsor anybody, especially Mr. McPherson. 
I've uh, sponsored several people in the Rotary Alliance, and they've been very successful in making friends. So that's all I can say is we're here. Uh, it's a two-way street. You open yourself up to me, I'll open myself up to you. Finally, a last comment would be that, um, kind of echoing what Phil just said, the events that um, have been important that we, we've introduced into the community, Robert, and I know that you support Wannaboom and, and asked about Wannaboom, and I'm hoping that that absolutely takes place. I encourage people, every time those events are happening where we have people that are coming from across our community and outside of our community into our community, that you introduce yourself, um, you know, to two, three, four, five people every time one of those events takes place that you don't know, because you're going to start to learn and, and, and learn about different people, um, get to know people from across the community. That's, that's what's important within any of the events. And, and it's difficult in this time um, that we're going through with the pandemic because we really can't do that. Um, it's not the same being on video right now as it is in person with people. So those are some things that I, I think are important and, and what we can be doing. And thanks for that question. Robert, uh, you're still on. Did you have any follow up or other questions? Yeah, I, Todd, I, I, I do appreciate what you, what you stated, um, you know, condemning it. Um, this isn't, I, I wasn't, this isn't about me in particular. I mean, I'm sure I'm just one person of many who's had this type of experience. So I do appreciate it. And, and honestly, I, I'm, I'm way more interested in, in actions over words. Uh, I will state, um, and with, with no disrespect, I know Phil, you were attempting to, to say something nicer there, but it, it telling people that they just need to make more friends. It, it's, it's not, it's not really helpful. Um, it, that's, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, I, I do participate with service organizations in the village. Uh, I'm, I'm not concerned about how many friends I have around here as, as far as that goes. That doesn't really address issues of, you know, if somebody is, uh, if somebody is from a, a protected class and they're gonna be less likely to put themselves out there if there are people out there actively doing that, that, you know, making them feel unwelcome in the community. I'm sure they're in the groups too, I don't know. I, I kind of feel like we're gonna smoke this fire. I really, you're right, uh, uh, Chris, I don't wanna debate this tonight. Uh, I just, you know, since Mike had asked that question, I wasn't even gonna bring it up, but I wanted to hear some, just your guys' thoughts and actions that could be taken. So thank you for taking my question. Thank you. Other side. Um, yeah, we do. There is another uh, hand up. Uh, Linda Ashmore, I'll bring her on here. There you go, Linda. Oops, sorry. There you go. Yeah, um, it's regarding the T wall settlement. So we, people weren't happy with just the 24 hour notice. I know it's legal, but it's not how business should be done, I don't think. So just that comment. Um, and then people that are in the community in our neighborhood, we're not really sure. Um, part of what he was originally asking for was a do over of the plan commission and of the village board votes. Was that part of the settlement or is the settlement just money? Todd, do you want to take that one or should I? Well, I, th I think we, I can be, I can, clearly state that the what you what you heard reported after the meeting about the terms of the settlement was the extent uh in other words uh the, there is no uh the the agreement does not include the reopening or granting uh rights to develop the property as it as it as it was in the development so does that does that answer that question linda yes it does okay Chris, um, did you have any other? No, I mean, I think you answered it. Um, it's difficult for us right now, this, just that it just came right at the uh, end of us making the decision on Tuesday night. Um, until we have the judge sign off on the settlement agreement, um, we really have a potential lawsuit still there, so we can't say that much yet. As um, soon as it is, as soon as that's been signed um, and it's done, um, I'm happy to answer any questions with regards to the T-Wall suit. But right now, um, I can't really say much more than that. I believe the 
judge's signature, <clears throat> uh, um, and I don't know the terminology, the, the official dismissal or whatever it is, um, is supposed to be taking place within the next couple of weeks. So this isn't a, this isn't a long term type process for us to move uh, from this sort of still in between position for us to the point when we're um, all done and settled with this. I guess I would also just add that on Monday night, Linda, um, the village attorney will be there and um, he could address the question that you're asking in regards to process um, and what we've gone through with this and making sure that we've done everything the way it's supposed to be done. And um, you know, that's probably gonna be the best way for us to answer that question right now. I'm not disputing that it was not legal. I'm just saying that as a citizen, 24 hours notice is not really, um, the best way to go. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, I don't see other hands up at the moment, but if anybody is interested in in a question, um, take advantage of that. Now, I, it's it's great to see that a number of you have kind of figured out this process. I've uh, again, this uh, this is kind of even the frankly the first time I'm taking a stab at a listening session like this with the uh, bringing people in and out of the process. So thanks for guinea, being a guinea pig as well as we work through this. Okay, Linda has another question. I have a question regarding the census. Do we have any statistics about how many people have returned the census in Wanakee since funding's based on that? Well, actually, I'm, I'm glad that to see that Kylie is still on with me. I know she's on because she's been taking notes for us, but Kylie's been in charge of the census for us. Um, Kylie, uh, I know you probably weren't prepared to jump on, but did you catch Linda's question and are you able to answer it? Yeah, I actually, while I was sitting here talking, had already brought up um, the Wanaki rates. And as of April 13th, it looks like our self-response rate is up to 74.8%. So um, seven, almost 75% of Wanakee has self-responded by this point. Well, there's an answer for that. That, uh, Linda, did that answer your question or was there more, more that you were curious about? Um, so the ones that haven't responded, are those door to door then or how do they follow up? So they're still going to be, um, I don't have the timeline in front of me, but they will still get, um, if not one more mailing, two, um, they'll still get a paper copy of the census in the mail. Um, and they have pushed back the door to door with all the COVID. Um, and like I said, I don't have that in front of me right now, but there still will be at least one mailing going out with a paper census to all households who haven't responded. And then as well as the door to door. Do we know anything about how we compare to other um, communities in the area? I can look a couple up really quick if you'd like. It's pretty easy. The, actually, it's inter the US Census does have a, a, an active page where you can look up any, any community and see their response rates real time. Oh. But yeah, see if, Kylie, see if you can find a couple. So, so far for Dane County and as a whole, they're at about 62.7%. Let's see if I can get some cities. And Prairie is at 66.4%. Let's see what I mean. Sun Prairie? Yeah, some periods at 66.4. Madison's at 60%. Oh, well, let's see, where's it Lodi? So it looks like we're actually at a pretty good percentage in comparison to other communities. Correct, Lodi is at a 70%. So we are doing fairly well for the communities around us. Thank you. All right, thanks Linda and Jerry.
Okay. Oop, I have, Linda, did you raise your hand again? If you have a question, let me bring you back. Did, did you have another question, Linda? No, I don't have one. Sorry, my oh, hand okay. must still be up. All right, sorry, I'll take care of that. Okay. No other hands are raised at the moment, Chris. Okay. Um, why don't we give it another 30 seconds and then I'll just have a couple of closing comments. Phil, do you have any closing comments you'd like to make? None. Uh, thanks for letting me participate. And uh, I hope that we can see each other face to face and smile at each other in the future real soon. Thanks, Phil. Any, any new ones, Todd? No, Chris. Okay. So, Thank you everybody for participating this evening. Um, these are for you. Um, the best we can answer the questions. If you have any additional questions, uh, make sure that you send in to either Phil, myself, Todd, or any of the board members um, with your questions um, or concerns that you might have, um, or just to give a compliment to our staff. Um, that's a great thing that uh, you can do for them um, during this time. And I would also just echo that it's not just our staff um, that's doing a great job right now, our whole community um, is pulling together and there's so many things between our business community, our residential community, um, our schools, and pulling everyone together to make sure that everyone gets through this time. Um, so if you know of people that are suffering out there, um, help them out. And if you have, have the means to help other people, um, please, by all means, um, no pun intended with the means word there, please help them um, in any way that you can. So thanks everybody for participating tonight. I think we'll end right there, Todd. All right, good. Good night. Thank you for participating, everyone. Thank you.